everybody. It's Wendy Adler bringing to you another articulating lecture. Um, I'm sorry that we're still all on house lockdown, but as I promised, I will continue to bring you these talks for as long as I have to until I can be back in front of you again person to person. So today we're going to talk about in the mood. How do artists have tools and techniques in their arsenal to be able to convey a mood in their paintings? Um, we're going to talk about four different paintings, but let's talk first about how does an artist use paint to convey a mood? Well, they can certainly use color, of course. Um, certain colors evoke different moods. We've talked about that many times before. Um, and what is an artist actually trying to do? Well, a lot of times an artist is trying to express oneself in their work. And so just by whatever they're trying to express, maybe they're able to convey that mood through their work, through the figures themselves or through the brush strokes or through the techniques that they use. So we'll examine that with all of these paintings. Um, the first one we wanna talk about is one that we've talked about before in previous talks. We're going to talk about Gustav Klimt's piece, The Kiss. And we've talked about this before, um, but just a little reminder. Gustav Klimt was an Austrian. He was born in 1862 and died in 1918. He was the most well-known artist to come out of Austria. Okay, And this is a very familiar image. We've seen this on everything from posters um, to napkins, aprons, whatever. This is one of the most reproduced images in the world. Um, his father was a goldsmith or silver engraver, and so we think maybe that's what some of the gold leaf in his style is attributed to. Um, he did go to art school at age 14, and he studied fresco and mosaic, so that we can tell certainly by a lot of these little mosaic looking pieces in the work. Um, he did commissions for murals and for ceilings. Um, he was um, highly thought of by the Emperor Franz Joseph and um, very successful during his lifetime. He was also quite the womanizer. We talked about that before too. So he was a romantic and he was living during the Art Nouveau period of time, which was early 1900s. Art Nouveau um, characteristics are things like outline. We see some outline in here. A lot of use of curves and bold, fantastic colors and very decorative styles. So this um, piece, The Kiss, definitely encompasses all of those characteristics. The Kiss was done in 1907, 1908, somewhere around there. It is an oil on canvas and the piece, if we were to see it in real life, is very large. It's about six foot by six foot. Um, it's hanging in the Belvedere Museum in Austria. It's not a realistic picture, of course, um, but we definitely can see what he's trying to show us. Um, a, a couple of lovers that are in a kiss, right? There's an embrace going on. Um, it's hard to tell whether they're standing up or lying down. We have the woman's feet down here. Um, we have what looks like a very um, uh, patchwork type of blanket or quilt. Um, this is her dress. So we have the characteristics of a couple that are obviously in love, right? Um, we think this is perhaps influenced by Byzantine art, which would have been the use of mosaic. So we have that same quality here. Um, very complex patterns, a lot of decoration. And if we saw this in person, um, the gold would be very metallic and lush. So that would be lovely to see, right? So what kind of a mood do we see here? Well, clearly we have the lovers, and so we've got some passion going on. The way that um, the man is tenderly holding the woman's face, the way that her eyes are closed as if perhaps she's in ecstasy. Um, so we have a lot of emotion in this picture. It's certainly not going to make anybody unhappy to see this picture. The use of colors is very bright. Um, the subject matter is one that most of us would be able to relate to. And so this is a pretty easy mood picture and that's probably why it's been recreated so many times because it does show love and love is something that we all can relate to. Okay, so that was an easy way to start this lecture. Um, we're going to move on. Our second piece here, let me remove the kiss, 
Our second piece here is also one that's probably familiar to you. And we haven't talked about Edvard Munch before. And even though it's spelled Munch, it's actually pronounced Munch. So Edvard Munch was Norwegian, uh, born in 1863, died in 1944. Um, he had a tragic life. His mother dies when he's five years old. His sister dies when he's 14. And there was mental illness in the family. And so not only did he personally struggle with that, but many members of his family had that as well. Alcoholism also ran rampant in the Munch family. Um, he paints um, a picture called The Sick Child to commemorate the death of his sister and what his sister had gone through. So these um, events of his childhood really stayed with him throughout his whole life. He's very rebellious. He reinvents himself in his style many times. Um, he, the quote that I liked from him was, all programs are destined to be abandoned. All programs are destined to be abandoned. Well, what does he mean by that? He means that he's going to experiment with a lot of different styles and uh, ways of trying to evoke a mood and try to convey what he's got in his head. Um, he's a very prolific guy. He does over 20,000 works in his lifetime. He does engravings and he does drawings and he does paintings. Um, so we have quite a bit to go on when we're trying to research Edvard Munch. Um, he would be considered an expressionist, which is somebody that was using their art to express their emotions. So that's, of course, fitting in very nicely with our In the Mood talk today. Um, he was very avant-garde, so he would have been thought of as very progressive in his style and in his subject matter. Um, his paintings seem to have very strong emotional forces, lots of anxiety, maybe even some love sometimes. And one of the things he says about love is, despair is the ultimate outcome of love. Despair is the ultimate outcome of love. Probably not a fun guy to have at a party, right? Okay, so Edvard Munch, um, he spends most of his time between Paris and Berlin until 1908, and then he spends the rest of his life in Norway, um, kind of like our friend Klimt is to Austria, Edvard Munch is to Norway. He's considered one of the best known Norwegian artists of our time. Um, and a lot of people compare his style to Van Gogh. Um, big brush strokes, lots of color, lots of emotion. Um, so even though Munch's uh, work came after Van Gogh, we can definitely see the influence there of Van Gogh on Munch's work. So we're going to talk about this picture, The Scream. We've all seen this before. Again, like The Kiss, it's a pretty commonly seen image. Um, this was painted in 1893. Sometimes it's referred to as the cry instead of the scream. Um, it was stolen once. There is um, actual truth to that myth. The piece was stolen from the Norwegian Museum, but it was found and returned three months later. So it does hang, the original hangs in the Norwegian Museum in Oslo. And the original is about 35 inches by 30 inches. So not much larger than the reproduction that I have here. Um, it is from a series that Munch did of 22 different paintings for a 1902 exhibition. The exhibition was called The Freeze of Life. So he was painting different emotions and scenes from life. Um, and the titles kind of give us a clue to the moods, not even a clue, they're actually pretty blatant. Uh, the titles had things like despair and melancholy and love. And so the scream falls into that or the cry falls into that category. He made five versions of this picture between 1893 and 1910. So he often revisited this particular piece. Um, we know for a fact that there are at least two paintings. There are two pastel drawings and one lithograph, all of a very similar um, scene here. One of the things that strikes me about this picture is that it's very psychologically raw, right? Everybody that looks at this picture is somewhat disturbed. 
Um, maybe we're disturbed because of all of the kineticism going on. We have an awful lot of energy and motion from the brush strokes here. Maybe we're disturbed because this figure here in the front looks disturbing. We can't tell whether it's a man or a woman, but obviously it's somebody in a lot of anguish and pain. Um, their hands are up on their ears and the open mouth. Clearly there's something going on here. We have two shadowy figures here in the background that look to be walking away from this person. And that is indeed what's happening. Uh, Mung says that he painted this picture from real life. It was based on, and I quote, hearing a huge endless scream coursing through nature while he's on a walk with his two companions. He then gets abandoned by his two companions and the air turns to blood. Isn't that horrible? What an awful thought. Um, so he does use these swirls and the vividness of the colors um, and a sexless face to express all of this. We have a couple other elements here that I actually didn't realize until I started studying this picture more. We have a fence line here that separates whatever's going on out here from our figures, right? And that fence is a really good border. We have a very strong diagonal in that picture. And we've talked about how important diagonals are to these pictures, right? That helps keep our head in the picture and steers our focus around. Um, he says, I do not paint what I see, but what I saw. So clearly this image is very strong in his head from whatever he heard that day and from whatever was going on with these companions of his. Um, this fence line also separates what we think is a body of water over here. Uh, we certainly have blue, but we also have these boats that are out in the horizon. Um, so we have a lot going on in this picture. People have said about this picture that it could only have been painted by a madman. And while maybe he wasn't a madman, clearly if we look back at his biographical information that I gave you earlier, there was definitely some trouble and some horrible childhood memories that affected him very strongly. One version of this particular picture, one of the pastel versions, sold for $120 million in the year 2012. Okay. So aside from the emotion we have about $120 million, what kind of emotion does this picture evoke? Well, as I said, I think that your, your guttural instinct on this would be um, horror and fear and there's anguish going on. Maybe it's scary. Certainly as a child, you might be scared looking at this picture. Um, I think if you can get past the subject matter, the colors themselves evoke feelings. They kind of battle with the subject matter. We have a lot of very strong, warm colors. We have lots of reds and yellows and oranges, which are warm colors, which would normally make us feel good. But maybe in this case, um, maybe they make us anxious. Maybe they think about, maybe they make you think about blood or something like that. Um, we have the green and the blue, but the green and the blue are clearly used in a secondary context here, right? Um, so I would say if I had to sum up the mood of this painting, I might say frightful, I might say horror, I might say angst. And it sounded to me like Munk would have said despair, the ultimate outcome of love. So that's a totally different feeling than what we had with our kiss by Klimt, right? All right, let's move on. So this is an artist that we have not spoken about yet. Um, and some of you are probably rolling your eyes and I know you are, I know who you are. Don't do it, I'm gonna talk you into this one, okay? Um, we're gonna talk about pop art for a moment. And when we bring up pop art, a lot of people will automatically think of Andy Warhol and the soup cans, okay? Yes, Andy Warhol was one of the founders of the pop art movement, but this artist, Roy Lichtenstein, was also one of the pop art founding fathers, if you wanna think of it that way. So what is pop art? Pop art is exactly what you think it should be. Pop stands for popular. Pop art is something that's popular something that's easily recognizable no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter how old you are, everybody recognizes a Campbell's soup can. 
everybody recognizes Marilyn Monroe. Even the kids that have never seen a Marilyn Monroe movie, when I talk to them about Andy Warhol and Marilyn Monroe, they all know who she is, inexplicably, because she's an icon. Pop art often uses iconic figures or items in its work, okay? So here we have Roy Lichtenstein, who clearly was inspired by comic strips and advertisements. He is American, he's from New York. He was born in 1923, died in 1997, um, and he is a pop artist. He went to Ohio State University, so he's not one of the guys that was born and raised in New York and never left. He actually went to Ohio State. He was drafted into the Army, and in the Army he serves as a draftsman. So he starts drawing while he's in the Army. We've had other artists that we've talked about that served our country in that capacity, too. Um, we spoke about Frederick Remington a couple months ago. He was also a draftsman. So Lichtenstein is a draftsman, and he's enlarging cartoons um, for his CO. Apparently his commanding officer had uh, problems with his vision, and so Lichtenstein would take cartoons that were in the Army newspapers, and he would enlarge them. Um, he taught for a while, and he became part of the Happenings art movement. And the Happenings was kind of the swing in 60s, maybe a little earlier than that, movement where a lot of artists combined real life and music and dance and art into like these performance art type of situations, often just everyday situations. So if I was going to do a pop art happenings performance, I might sit here and peel an orange and eat it. That would be it. That's the happenings. But you have to remember the time period, right? It was the late 50s, early 60s. There was a lot of rebellion and change. And this was artists' response to abstract expressionism. They were ready for something new, so they were moving on. They were moving away from abstract expressionism, and they moved into familiar stuff. Okay? So we're looking at this picture. And even if you don't know anything about this picture, you definitely can read the words. It says, maybe... He became ill and couldn't leave the studio. And we have a picture of a young woman who looks perhaps uh, concerned about all of this. Um, and this was a typical Roy Lichtenstein picture, okay? He used a particular style of animation called Bende Dots. And basically what that is, is he uses pixelated dots and combines them in close proximity to each other to create the color and create the image, okay? So we can see that we've got the use of the Bende dots on the woman's face um, and in some of the background. We've got very bright, bold primary colors. Um, there's no green, there's no blending. It's all reds, yellows, blues blacks and whites, so it looks very much like a comic strip would look. Um, he often would also appropriate images, and we've talked about what appropriation is before. Appropriation is when you take somebody else's design or somebody else's artwork and you make it your own. So Roy Lichtenstein, his very first claim to fame was a picture called Look Mickey, and it was Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse done in this cartoon style, but in recognizable form so that you could see that it was Donald Duck and that it was Mickey Mouse. And it was a picture of Donald Duck hooking himself with a fishing pole and pointing it out to Mickey and Mickey is giggling. So that was his first famous picture. But then the style caught on and his sons actually challenged him to copy other cartoonist style. And that's how Lichtenstein's style evolved. So let's talk a little bit more about Mamebi. Mamebi was done in 1965, and the picture itself is large. It's about five foot by five foot, and it hangs in a German museum. But we have seen many different um, reproductions of this work. Because it's such a famous work of his, we see this also on posters and on aprons and reproduced on plates, and you might even see other reproductions of this in museums other than in Germany. Um, we have the primary colors and we have this glamorous blonde woman who does appear in other works of his. Apparently Lichtenstein um, um, took a personification of himself into a character. Uh, he named it Brad 
and then oftentimes Brad, his alter ego, and this woman appear in other works that Lichtenstein did. But here we have the woman who doesn't have a name, um, and she's clearly nervous, and we don't know anything about her. We don't know the basics. We don't know who she is. We don't know who she's waiting for. We don't know what it was they were supposed to do together. We don't know what time period we're looking at. We don't really even know where it is, although we can kind of guess it's a city by this background here, but we don't know which city. So we don't know any of the whys. We don't know any of the five W's that we normally would need to satisfy ourselves when we look at a picture. That makes this difficult. Lichtenstein's style was both revered as a change and reviled by people that thought all he was doing was copying other stuff that we had seen. And you probably are having those same emotions. Either you really like this because it's something easy for you to look at and understand, or maybe you think that he's cheating because he's copying something else that we've all seen and understand. Um, but again, that evokes its own mood, doesn't it? A German collector paid $30,000 for the original here in 1965 when the work was first produced. I can tell you it's worth significantly more now. Multiples of that. Um, but what kind of mood does this have overall? Probably some tension. Maybe some uncertainty. Maybe you're disgusted because you don't like the style of pop art. Maybe you're interested because now we've talked a little bit more about how the style evolved, right? But there's definitely some moods that are affiliated with this work, okay? All right, moving on to our last piece. It's hard doing this without you all to talk back to me, so hopefully I'll get some nice emails from you and you can give me your opinions of this. Okay. So this is our last piece. Again, it might be one that you've seen before. I tried to use works that I thought might be familiar and yet still challenge you a little bit. So um, this is a work by Andrew Wyeth, also an American. Um, spent most of his life in either Pennsylvania or in Maine. Um, he was born in Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania. He has two sons that have also become artists over the years. Um, but Andrew lived from 1917 to 2009, so he lived a very long, prolific life. He was a painter in the realism style. So even though he was living and working during the time of abstract expressionism and during the whole pop art thing, his style is much more realistic. The pictures that he painted and drew um, are easily subject recognizable, right? We can see that we have a woman in a field, we have farmhouses in the background, maybe it even looks like somewhere familiar to you. Um, he learned his craft from his father. His father was a very prominent illustrator. His name was N.C. Wyeth. Um, and he had five children in his family, all of whom were homeschooled. Um, Andrew Wyeth was not in great health, and so we've heard that before. Uh, a lot of these guys become artists because they're in poor health and they can't be out um, playing sports or running around with their friends. Um, so he did, he did learn his craft from his father, the illustrator. Um, he starts to sell his works at a pretty early age. He's about 18 years old when he actually begins to sell his watercolors, and he decides to be a painter, not an illustrator like Dad. So he's looking to still be an artist, but he wants to take a different course from dad. Probably a good decision. Um, his father dies in 1945, and this affects Andrew very strongly because they had quite a bond. I mean, his father had been his teacher and his mentor and clearly one of his critics and somebody that he could go to when he needed advice. And when his father passed away, of course, that wasn't there anymore. Um, he uses very subdued colors pretty much through his entire canon of work. Um, subdued, almost monochromatic, and we can see that in this picture here. And it's not your eyesight that's failing, it is getting a little dark, it might even start to rain on us here, so I'm going to talk and see how much longer we can go. Um, back to Andrew. Andrew shows the truth of an object. That was kind of the objective of realism style, was to show something that had a truth to it, okay? And we definitely see that in this work here. So this piece is called Christina's World. Uh, this is Christina. This was done in 1948 and is owned by uh, MoMA in New York. 
The actual picture is 32 inches by 47 inches. So it's about this size. And it's painted with egg tempera on a gesso panel. So that's a lot of vocab right there, right? Egg tempera, you might recall we talked about, is um, when the pigment powder itself is mixed with egg, uh, egg whites to give it the consistency. Um, and the gesso panel would be a piece of wood that's had a light coating of gesso, which is kind of like a thinned glue to prime the panel. Okay, so an egg tempera on wood panel is the medium that he chose to use. Um, what are we looking at? Well, we have, uh, where are we in this picture? We're pretty much where you're sitting right now. Okay, so the viewer is at the base of the hill, um, kind of looking up a little bit. Um, we have an old aged looking barn um, depicted by the use of kind of that faded gray color in the distance. Um, it's daytime, of course. We have some shadow on the barn, on the farmhouse itself. We have some birds um, flying here and their shadows are reflected on this farmhouse here. Rumor is that some of those birds were added later, uh, particularly after Christina's death to commemorate her, but I don't know how much of that's actually true. So we have the birds very faintly and small here in the background. Um, over here in our farmhouse, we have a ladder that's leaning up against the house. We have um, laundry that's flapping on the line. We have um, a piece of farm equipment. We have the fence posts and presumably some sort of barbed wire fence along the, the edge. So it's definitely a home where somebody's living, right? We don't know if it's Christina that lives there, but we definitely know there's somebody that's living there. Um, so we have an old kind of farm scene, right? We have a lot of land. We have the grass that's clearly been cleared or mowed around a particular portion. Um, so let's talk about the woman for a moment here, right? So we have a woman, her hair is dark with a little bit of sun kind of glinting on it. She's windblown, right? So it's obviously a windy day and we can tell that not just by the hair, but also by the movement in the grass or the weed or whatever it is that she's sitting in here. Um, she's wearing a faded pink dress with a little belt. Her arms are extremely thin. Um, I didn't notice that at first, but if you look at her hands, and maybe we can zoom in a little bit, her hands are very large and her arms are very, very thin. And she's in this faded pink dress. She does have shoes on and she's sitting in kind of a funny angle. She's sort of leaning or almost like she's crawling, like she's gonna crawl herself up the hill to this house. Um, the colors, are they warm or cool? It's kind of an interesting question, right? We talked about the fact that he likes to use monochromaticism or one sort of palette of colors, and he's definitely done that here, except for this soft pink, but this soft pink is even a little bit yellowish. Um, so I would say that the colors are kind of warm, but if you said they were cool, I probably wouldn't argue with you because they're very, very neutral in color. Um, this is Christina, hence the title, Christina's World. And Christina was a family friend of Andrew Wyeth, um, and she was crippled. She had been stricken with polio as a child. She needed a wheelchair to get, a, get around. And yet we don't see the wheelchair here. And we don't see canes. We don't see any way for how Christina ended up here on the hill. And how is she going to get back to the house? Would have been pretty hard to wheel her up this hill to the house in a wheelchair. So that's part of the mystery of this picture. Um, Christina lived in this farmhouse and she took care of her father and brother for many, many years. She never married. Um, there is rumor that she and Andrew Wyeth were perhaps lovers, but that is not substantiated. It's just a rumor. We all like rumors, don't we? Um, Andrew used the upstairs room in this farmhouse as his studio. And so we think that perhaps Andrew had looked out the window one day and perhaps Christina was sitting out there in the field just enjoying the weather maybe. Hard to say whether this was a true to life scene or whether this was something that he was thinking or wishing or, or what. So Christina's world has a lot of mystery to it. Um, some people find it unsettling. Some people find it lovely and beautiful and serene and calm. Hard to say. 
Other people think that maybe Wyatt's wife, Betsy, was used to model in this picture as the figure because it would have been very difficult for Christina to be sitting here in this position. Hard to say. So there's a lot of unanswered questions for this particular work. The other thing about this piece is it's called Christina's World. World. Well, world would mean something that everybody lives in. This was probably the extent of Christina's world. She had no way of going away from this place. She couldn't get away. She couldn't, she didn't have the mobility to move around. So this was called Christina's world and it probably was all that was in her world. Kind of sad, right? So here we have another mood evoked. Um, maybe it symbolizes the uphill struggle of paralysis, right? We definitely have a hill going on here. Um, and there was definitely hardship and suffering in the world for farm people in the 40s. We had a lot going on in the 40s, right? And the farms were hard hit. So I think this picture has a lot of emotion to it, a lot of mood, but we don't really know what Andrew Wyeth's mood was. Um, what would you say? What do you think? I think perhaps loneliness is something that strikes me about this picture. I think there's a sense of melancholy. Um, I think maybe even a sense of exclusion. Here's Christina looking at the farmhouse and looking at the farm. And really, she has such a limited way of participating. Um, but others may find this serene. Others may even find this familiar. Maybe you lived somewhere in a, in a farm area um, where this scene would have been comforting. Maybe it reminds you of home. But those are the things that I would say with this picture. So what conclusions can we draw today? Well, artists definitely work to convey a mood in their work, for sure. And different ways that they may do that would be with their brush strokes or with their technique maybe with their choices of colors, maybe with their, um, maybe with words like Lichtenstein did, uh, or maybe with symbolism. Maybe there's some allegory in some of these pictures. I think the Wyatt suggests that there might be some allegorical use in the way that they express emotion. Anyway, whatever you were able to get out of this lecture, if nothing else, I hope it was a nice diversion for you. I miss being able to give our talks in person and I look forward to being able to do that again soon. By all means, please email me if you have any comments or requests or you're just bored and you want someone to email you back. I promise I will respond. Thanks, everybody. Take care and I'll see you again soon.